Welcome to The People's Podcast, an employer's resource by Group Management Services. I'm your host, Elise Kimball. This podcast does not constitute legal or financial advice. Its accuracy, completeness, or adequacy is not guaranteed. Use the information at your own risk. Consult an attorney or financial advisor before taking any action. Hi, my name is Elise Kimball. I am the Training Development Manager here at GMS, and I am sitting here with Chas Billington, attorney at Worries. Uh, welcome today. Appreciate you joining us. And we're going to be talking about HR compliance. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, the very first question I want to ask um, is going to kind of kick us off is, why is got a compliance so hard for small business owners to manage? And what does it really even entail? That's a multifaceted question. What doesn't it entail? I right. think is probably the, the, uh, the more salient point. I mean, it's following the law. And particularly in the HR space, there are so many laws, and we'll talk a little bit later about the interplay between federal and state law, and it's increasingly become very difficult to follow the various laws. Every state has got its own set of employment laws for the most part, and now uh, smaller jurisdictions, cities, counties, um, are increasingly having their own laws, which is making it really difficult from a compliance perspective, and, and really every facet of HR you know, when you talk about the employee life cycle, right? So hiring's got its own set of laws, including job postings. And then you move into the employee relations side, performance management, discipline, discharge, all have these various laws. And even through termination, there are many, many more laws that come into play there. And that's not even getting into benefits and things like that. So when you talk about what is compliance in HR, everything in HR entails some form of compliance with some law and increasingly in this more remote world, we're hiring more and more across state lines, things like that. It's become incredibly difficult to yeah. comply with uh, the various state and federal laws. Absolutely. And I can't even imagine a small business trying to navigate that, no. that field or that area. Um, so let's talk about um, how kind of small businesses, why is it hard for small businesses to kind of understand compliance? Um, you just talked about the f- multifaceted areas of it. Um, when it comes to um, HR managers or small business owners, what are maybe some of the main things that they need to be kind of looking out for right now when it comes to compliance? It's an interesting question. So, you know, there's no compliance.com. Uh, <laughs> maybe actually we should. That'd be helpful. Let's, do compliance. let's make it. Com. Yeah. Right, cut this part out. Okay. Um, that's going to be proprietary. Uh, that's the problem. Though. There's a single source right now. You can't just hop on and look at a single source and say, okay, what state am I in? What city am I in? Like, what am I doing? And how does it gonna be? How is it affecting the various laws? There's no real way to do that. And so we find that people are increasingly just what doing what, what everybody does, Google, or now chat GPT, which I really don't recommend. Potentially we'll talk about that Ooh, later. Okay. But I think small business owners, I think sometimes don't understand the question that they need to ask, right? They have yeah. a good understanding of kind of what's going on and they can kind of get around the periphery but they have a really hard time, I think, articulating exactly the question that they have that's going to lead them to the source. And furthermore, you may find a source, but if you're talking about benefits, you might have a reset and the IRS code, right? And you might not know to go to both of those. Likewise, there may be some esoteric state law on point that you might not know about. So you catch the federal law and it's like, great, we're fully compliant. But there was a state law there or a county law there yeah. or a city law there that you missed. And so it becomes uh, nearly impossible. I mean, it's difficult for institutions like my law firm. You know, we spend a tremendous amount of time and effort trying to make sure that we understand the compliance landscape right. across the nation. You know, virtually impossible for a small business owner to do it, I think, effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that there were a lot of um, a lot of obvious reasons why, you know, Compliance is so important for businesses like fines or investigations, those kind of things. Yeah. But what are maybe some of the less obvious reasons yeah. that um, compliance is so important for a business owner? Well, I think, you know, particularly GMS, that was a lot about hiring and retention. <laughs> yes. um, those are two, I think, things that people don't think about a lot. Absolutely. Now we've got what? We've got Yelp, we've got Glassdoor, we've got mm-hmm. Indeed, we've got all yeah. these platforms where one can go tee off on one's employer if one is so uh, inclined. And so there's this reputational risk that really dovetails into talent attraction and yeah. attention. Yeah. Increasingly, people are looking out and trying to vet their employer prior to joining. Yeah. They get a bad reputation if people are seeing this stuff out in the ether. And certainly that can have an effect both on your talent attraction, but also on your retention. When you have 
problems in the workplace, when you have people perceive inequity, perceive discrimination, um, you know, you're going to have trouble retaining people, right? And so you may have people in this job market, they can easily go out onto the internet and go find another job somewhere else. And I think that's the side that people don't see as long as well as sometimes in this arena that we're in with the internet, increasingly it's publicity. I mean, yeah. you can get some bad publicity out there in a way that you really historically couldn't. You know, take, for instance, even 10, 15 years ago, plane dealer really didn't care about some small employer somewhere. Right. But nowadays, you know, you can go out on LinkedIn and you can go start your own blog that looks very official, give it a very official name, and you can say whatever you want out there, right? And it is, it has an effect in the marketplace. It is very difficult to take down. Ask any attorney how easy it is to take down a Yelp review or to take down a Google review or to take down something off Indeed or Glassdoor. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult to do once it's up, it lives forever. Yeah. And I think that a lot of small businesses really rely on their reputation in the market right. to drive business to them. Yeah. So reputation is a huge part. Word I think, of mouth, of that. right? Absolutely. And a lot of hiring's done word of mouth. And I think if if that rep, if your street rep yeah. is bad, it's gonna be tough for you to pull in new talent, particularly the talent you want. Hiring is one thing, hiring the right people is an entirely different thing. Very, very true. Very true. Um, so I know I was so excited to have you on here today because I really wanted to talk about the emerging compliance kind of issues right now. Um, so let's start maybe with the first one, which is uh, multi-state compliance. I yeah. know that you were definitely excited to talk about that. Yeah, today. so nothing going on in that space. Um, <laughs> just nothing to talk about. Um, just completely dead. <laughs> yeah, let's just yeah. move on. Um, okay. You know, I view that as probably the single source of risk amongst uh, even increasingly small employers. If you think about it, COVID is, you know, was the game changer, right? Oh, yeah. We moved to this increasingly remote world and then couple that with the advent of the internet several years ago, but now everybody is using the internet to hire. So you're using indeed the LinkedIn, these stuff, these places I've talked about. So you're hiring outside of your geographic footprint, whether you necessarily know it or not. Yeah. You know, you're getting applicants from all kinds of different states. And as we talked about earlier, these states have their own laws, including increasingly pay transparency laws, right? The postings have to be correct. You might have to have the salary band on there. You yep. might have to have certain kinds of disclosures. You sitting here in, you know, well, let's just say Akron for mm -hmm. the listeners. We're in Akron, Ohio, may not necessarily have the same compliance risks as somebody in Colorado or Minnesota or right. one of these other states where we have these laws, God forbid, California, <laughs> which in and of itself is a planet with its own ecosystem. It really is. Laws and regulations. It's the wild west out there. I jokingly said the other day to somebody that being in California is essentially its own protected class. You know, you have to pay special attention to somebody in California. We do. And if you're hiring, if you are looking into California, if you're thinking, hey, I'm just going to pick up a remote person, they're really good at what they do. They're in California. doesn't matter, but they work for me in Ohio. No, they are subject to California's laws, yeah. regulations. There are certain things they have to get in those states. And the same would be true in any state. Yeah. And so that landscape has become increasingly difficult to navigate for small employers. You know, you look at the news, Minnesota just passed something, New York just passed something. You, Every time you turn around, there is some new law or regulation that is passing. New York City just passed something, you know, where you are now going to have to be compliant with that thing. And that may require a change to your processes and procedures that you are either not equipped to handle or you flatly don't know about. And right. so I don't think enough people are thinking about this concept of, yeah, I, I may live in one place, but my reach is necessarily much further. I am availing myself to the laws of particular jurisdictions about which I know nothing. Yeah, absolutely. And that, my goodness, would be so hard to kind of navigate as a small business owner when you don't have the time or resources. It's hard to for do me. It. <laughs> <laughs> I got the ESQ. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, let's talk FL FLSA. So um, wage and labor compliance is such a huge part of, you know, obviously having employees. Um, we I did I definitely wanted to talk about um Compliance is about the journey, not the destination. Yes. You mentioned this in kind of our notes. So kind of extrapolate on that. C tell me a little bit more. I'm going to vamp on that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, no problem. So FLSA passed years and years and years and years ago, right? Before things like the internet, TVs, cell phones, all these things. Yeah. And the law has not had a large scale kind of revamp 
since that time. I mean, when you, you're dealing with, you know, canaries and coal mines and children working inside <laughs> um, factories and things like that, that's around the time when yeah. the FLSA is coming into play. And so, you know, it is not a modern law. And so right. we are being held to sort of these, you know, esoteric laws in the modern workplace. And that is very, very difficult. The FLSA, for the most part, is largely what I would consider to be nearly a strict liability statute. So the FLSA doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care about your intention. It just cares that you comply. Okay. And so, you know, you are in a place where when you talk about the FLSA, and by the way, it's industry specific. I've been on a, a bit of a kick lately doing a lot of hospitality work. I actually didn't know that. So a lot of hospitality work, a lot of healthcare work, and a lot of okay. manufacturing work is a lot of what I do. Each of those industries has their own, let's call them idiosyncrasies when it comes to the FLSA. So, is this federally regulated? So it's both federal and state. So, wow. You know, okay. The FLSA itself, the Fair Labor Standards Act, is federal law. Yes. But most states are going to have some form, whether that's Tweaking. minimum wage and overtime, right, or it's some other kind of law that you know tipped employee credits, you know, tip credits, tip pools, you know, that kind of thing. All are going to be state specific for the most part. You know, some states don't have them, some states do. Uh huh. But that framework makes it largely a journey you don't ever get to a place where you say we did it guys everybody huddle up high five we are flsa and state law compliant that is not a thing you need to be constantly auditing you need to be constantly tweaking constantly looking at what is the real world um implication of the policies that i'm passing right i might have right. a policy that says you know you can't work before your shift and it's like cool we just rely on that right nobody's working before their shift nobody's working through their lunch break because the Seems policy pretty easy. says not to do it, right. right? No, that is frequently not the case, <laughs> right? You got to get out and look and see what this stuff's doing. And that is this concept of the, the journey of FLSA compliance. Okay. And I, you know, you know, one of the, we see a lot in this space, you know, regular rate of pay is a big one. When you pay somebody and there's bonuses or, you know, there's shift premiums or there's, you know, there's all these different things that get baked into how somebody gets paid, yeah. that affects their regular rate of pay, which necessarily has an impact on their overtime pay. And we find increasingly that people just are like, wait, what? I, I didn't understand that that needed to be worked into the base rate and therefore affect the overtime. Um, and a lot of software that we see, it doesn't do it out of the box. And when really? you go to talk to the vendor and you say, well, guys, you didn't do this right. They say, not a problem. Did you read the 75 pages of fine print, which says that this is on you, A, and B, we're not identifying you for it. And that is B, you know, that causes this to be a very difficult place where you need to really understand the FLSA. You need to understand the compliance concerns going into it. And then you got to be constantly monitoring it. I mean, just saying we pay minimum wage and we pay overtime. Is that really good enough? Right. Um, you need to be auditing the actual on the ground practices. And that's why I often say this is not it's not a destination. You don't get there. Yeah. <laughs> you keep it's a journey yeah. to being compliant. Absolutely. Amazing job security for me. <laughs> um, yeah. Until they amend the law. And then the FLSA, if we talk about it again, minimum, the uh, salary threshold, right? You yeah. To go up pretty significantly. Wow. And that's not on a lot of people's radar. It's like 30%, right? Yeah. Even it's a significant increase. Yeah. And it, you know, we saw this in 2016. Yeah. Freaked out because people were either going to go have to go hourly or they were going to have to get raises. Mm -hmm. Guess what? gang like we're right back there and maybe the law gets enjoined right maybe it doesn't go into effect maybe it does but i think it should be on everybody's radar yeah. these concerns and uh, i think that this is definitely a, an area that i would highlight from a compliance perspective like a good you know a good lawyer a good vendor can come in audit this stuff it's relatively inexpensive when you talk about the actual potential liability on the back end of it these come in the form of collective actions course because we write the laws right you get attorney's fees and things like that yeah you get liquidated damages and all this stuff so it mounts up pretty quickly even with small population absolutely and expensive um lawyers and and different practices like that. i'm a very reasonable lawyer. okay i didn't, I didn't <laughs> point any fingers a hand pointing yeah um gesturing. for sure gesturing in general um but that can be you know a cost that a, a small business owner does not have the overhead for so and small businesses really love unexpected costs oh they love them right they, they have so much money for that stuff right. set aside this is an easy putt absolutely um, I think let's talk about something that's on a lot of uh, business owners' minds, not necessarily small business owners, but um, non-competes. Yep. So are they going to be legal? <laughs> What's going on? So 
I, so the FTC has issued this rule, which will effectively wipe out all non-competes. It's a subject of a lot of litigation. Yep. Uh, a lot of lawyer fees being spent on this one. Um, I think there is probably a below 50% chance that it gets across the finish line in the way that it's written today. Gotcha. The downstream effect is going to be more interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Whether the FTC has this form of authority, I think is up for debate. I think there are pretty, I think there are pretty convincing arguments that maybe it doesn't. It's the subject, like I said, of, of litigation wouldn't go into effect necessarily until the very earliest in September, um, if at all. Yeah. Um, I think that what it's going to probably do is cause more state based legislation. And that has held up to scrutiny on multiple occasions. States like, you know, California, where you flatly can't have a non compete, but increasingly yeah. other states are getting into this and either significantly limiting your ability to have a non compete or flatly saying you can't have a non compete. And I think that, you know, if you're a business owner right now, I am watching this rule. If you've got non-competes in place, you are going to have to do some stuff if this goes into effect. But I would also encourage folks to start thinking about, like, do we really need this? Does somebody, you know, the, the famous example, I, I can't recall if it was a, a Jimmy John's or Quiznos, was locking folks in a non I remember this. Yes. Right? And then <laughs> you go to Subway and you got the special sauce, no pun intended. Yeah. And also you can't go work for them. Didn't they put like a salary threshold on it then? No. Okay. Some do, yes. Yeah. Some states have salary thresholds. I believe Illinois is one of them where, you know, you have to be at a certain salary right. threshold to be subject to a not compete. The new law is just flatly no not competes. Gotcha. Um, and it's going to have some downstream effects. I think states are going to get into it. I think you're going to see increasingly states get into the not compete game. And I think, you know, if you're a small business owner, it's probably thinking a lot about like, do we need this? Are yeah. there other mechanisms that we know are going to be safe going forward? Not right. disclosure agreements. Yep. Um, in particular, potential, potentially non-solicitation agreements that are going to adequately protect us in this space in the event that this law does go into effect and or another law comes down the pipeline and we got to do this whole exercise again in a couple of years. Right. Absolutely. Well, that's good. That's good advice to business owners. Absolutely. Um. I think we have a little bit of time here. So let's talk briefly about AI in the workplace. I know this is a favorite topic of yours. Oh, love it. Love it. So um, so as a, a HR manager, I can just go on chat GPT and just, you know, put an input, hey, write me a um, play handbook for right. 2024 and it would be compliant, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, I would say compliant-ish. Um, it, would, it would be like, It'd be hovering around compliance. Gotcha. I, I love this area right now because you know re- rarely do you see this sea change. You yeah. Know, a, a technology fundamentally disrupts every facet of your life. And certainly the workplace is going to be no exception here. And AI is increasingly in the workplace. I mean, I have told employers before when we talk about drafting policies for AI usage, you know, do you have a handle on if AI is being used in the workforce? So like, nah, our folks don't use AI. Turns out they probably are. They're almost assuredly using oh, yeah. GPT or Google's Bard or Gemini, yep. using Copilot, which now is getting baked into everything. It's in everything. Your iPhone is about to get a built-in AI, uh, AI system. Which well. one is that? So the Apple Intelligence is okay. the one they just announced. <clears throat> is it based off of OpenAI? Yes. Okay. So it's built off the OpenAI backbone, yeah. and it is going to do probably increasingly more and more as the software kind of evolves. But I, you know, the one thing I tell folks increasingly is it's almost assuredly already in your workplace. People oh, yeah. are using it. And For sure. You know, A, how they're using it <clears throat> and are there guardrails around how they're using it, right? Are you just loading a bunch of proprietary information into this thing? And, you know, oh, hey, here's all of our financials for the last 10 years. Could you just summarize that for me? Put in an Excel document. Yeah, just Excel, you know, or <laughs> I, the, one of the examples I read was a woman was, out, uh, I think it was on it's like a Reddit example or something like that. And she's like, well, I, I absolutely love this software. I take all of our leadership, our board level meetings, all of the slide decks, because I need to summarize those slide decks and I load them into ChatGPT and I tell ChatGPT, give me a summary. And I got to tell you, it is really good. But guess what? Now all that stuff is out there, right? Yep. It is owned. OpenAI has access to it and so do others. So, you know, there are myriad examples of this thing, this kinds of things happening. And I think employers need to get a grip on, okay, do, how is this even being used in the workplace and what guardrails are we going to put in place? Right. I mean, a solid policy 
is a great starting point. So kind of that lives in your employee handbook. Totally. People sign off on it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I agree Are with there you. handbooks anymore? I feel like it's just like an intranet now. There's just all yes. that is passing out the handbook. Well, mm, I like think. Personnel file. Yeah. Whatever, that was a thing. Like, <laughs> yes. oh, I'll get the personnel file. It's like, I don't even know what that is. Right. I think it all lives electronically now. Yeah. Nobody's printed it out, right. hopefully. But, but yeah, you, a yes. policy would be great. Right. And then the policy's got to be coupled with training. Like, absolutely. Here's what to do, what not to do. Here's a clearinghouse or a committee that talks about the new use of AI. Like yeah. How are we going to use it? Or, and then auditing it. You yeah. Know, we've seen a lot of implicit bias built into these systems where you, know, if you have a recruiting tool that overwhelmingly selects men or overwhelmingly selects women. And it's like, well, we didn't train it to do that. It's like, well, but you did actually. Because yes. The data set that you gave it built in an, an implicit bias into the system that now its output is implicitly biased. Yep. And guess what? At day's end, if you say to the vendor, hey, by the way, I didn't do this. Your system did it. They're, they're going to tell you what? Yeah, tough. tough luck. Yeah, tough yeah. luck. That's how it works. And these are working their way through litigation right now. Who's ultimately responsible for this? Is it going to be the employer? Is it going to be the vendor? Um, I would just recommend you don't get in that fight. Um, you know, there are definitely things that you can do ahead of that to stop you from having to get through protracted litigation to figure out who's going to pay. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, such a um, crazy landscape right now with, you know, compliance that I don't even think as a business owner, you really even want to navigate. Yeah. So just get somebody involved who like a Chaz or like a GMS who can kind of assist you or kind of guide you. Um, in those kind of things. So um, let's, like our last topic here, let's talk a little bit about a risk assessment because yeah. I think that's really important for our business to do. How often do, would you say that they should be doing a risk assessment? Yeah, everyone loves auditing. <laughs> I, it's, well, I think everyone's- I like, love it, you know, I so much. I have more audits in my life. Yeah. And I, boy, have you come to the right place. Um, love it. So this is a tailor-made lawyer question. So risk assessments, I would argue, are ongoing, right? I mean, we talked about having these cadences or intervals, you have FLSA, things like that. I mean, typically, at least taking a topic and looking at it annually, okay. um, at minimum, right? Like right. You should be looking at your handbook at least once a year, if not maybe you know, once every other year. Do all these compliant or all these policies, are they still compliant? You should be looking at your FLSA you know, practices, procedures, and policies and ensuring, yeah, like, are these things doing what we say they're doing and auditing the wage and hour records to make sure that, yeah, in fact, what we think is happening is happening. Um, benefits is the same way. There are multiple benefits, compliance issues that you just need to have on a regular cadence. Again, these things, when done on a more frequent basis, are it's a lot more cost effective to do them on a more frequent basis right. than it is to It's say, upkeep then, right? Yeah, 100%. It's just yeah. maintenance, right? Otherwise, it's, oh, no, um, the DOL's here. Um, <laughs> can you please sort this out for me? By the way, we haven't looked at this in 15 years. Oh, my um, gosh. Not the time. No. To do it. Mm -mm. You know, it's too late. What is it? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Absolutely. Um, absolutely, that is the case when we talk about legal compliance and risk assessments and audits and things like that. It's painful. Nobody likes to do it. But at day's end, it ends up being a tremendous cost savings and a, and a risk mitigation tool. Absolutely. Who needs to be involved in that? Would they need to reach out to a partner like yourself um, to do those uh, annual audits? Um, would it just be kind of like just in time if they feel like they need, maybe there's a new law in place, right. they feel like they need to be looked at? Um, what are their resource options and who needs to be involved in that? Maybe an HR manager internally would work with you or what would that look like? So there are a variety of ways to do it. You know, typically we like to be in on the front end. Of, I might not run an entire audit, but right. I might, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, puppet master the thing. I might come in and say, you know, here are the areas we think are interesting, where we think you should look at. And there are different ways to do it, right? I mean, it could be, hey, we don't want a deep dive. We don't want to right. go subatomic with this thing. We want this kind of audit. Okay, great. We, you know, we or a vendor can craft that for you. Right. A lot of good vendors out there as well that will do very niche related audits. Um, but, you know, for us as well, like we'll be in the front end and absolutely HR needs to be involved. But typically it's any stakeholder who is going to touch these policies. So when we talk about, you know, let's talk about trade secret protection or confidentiality. We're probably going to need your IT in that, right? Yeah. Um, in certain instances, when we talk about wage and hour policies, well, operations is going to need to be involved yep. in that because they are the individuals who are going to be meeting this policy out day to day. You know, so really starting at the top about what is the subject we're going to look at and who are the relevant stakeholders 
there within. So we can start putting together a group of people who know, who have the relevant information, who all can sit down and talk about, okay, great. Now we got the squad together. We know where we're going. We've got the plan. Let's just go ahead and do this thing. And we got everybody we need right there. And from an efficiency standpoint, that's absolutely the way to do it. So really it's the stakeholders. And then typically we like to see some kind of executive sponsor, right? Everything's top down. If you've got somebody on the C-suite, some exec who says, yeah, this is important for us. This right. is something that we need you to do. And, and yeah, I frequently tell my clients, and I learned this from my wife who's a school teacher. It's, you know, you need to say the why. Um, you can't just say, you know, like with my kids, go do that. Why? Well, because I own you. Um, <laughs> that is not a sufficient answer. Uh, right. It's, hey, here's why we're doing this. Yes. Why it's important to the yeah. company. Here's what it means for the bottom line. And here's why I need you to do it. Why I'm asking you to do it. And that kind of sponsorship at the top, I think carries a lot of weight. And certainly will help the process and keep folks more engaged. And then having just for the you know, please have some kind of time frame on it. Absolutely. Open it and not, it's no good. <laughs> Absolutely. You have to have a, a due date for right. sure. Keep Absolutely. It um, well, I love that so much. I think that is really important for a business owner to understand that, you know, if you just maintenance, keep on top of this, it makes it so much easier to manage. So um I wanted to thank you again for your time, Chaz. It was a pleasure having you on. And if you guys have any um, questions for Chaz, please leave them in the chat. Um, we are happy to answer those for you. So Chaz Billington, once again, attorney at Voorhees. And um, hopefully you guys join us again for our next podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks.